Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the Monday seminar. Uh, today we are very happy to welcome uh, Benjamin Einstein, who comes from the uh, University of California, San Diego, and he's visiting IFT uh, for uh, one month or you know, a little longer. Yeah. Okay. So still uh, at least two weeks to go. Three, okay. three, two weeks to go. Weeks. Okay. And uh, he is uh, going to tell us about lepton flavor universality anomalies. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, as I said, I'm going to be here for uh, another three weeks. So, uh, if anyone wants to discuss this further, I'm uh, obviously the team is welcome to stop by and talk to me. So, um, and I should actually, I, I missed this, I should have put in here the name of. Uh, uh, my collaborators, in particular Jason Abisher, who's a postdoc that just left, and a lot of the work was on there. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So I organized this talk this way. I'm going to first spend about half the time. So it's probably going to try to rush this uh, reviewing anomalies, and, and there's an update there of the numbers of the seeds. Um, I assume that um, few of you or none of you actively work in this field, but you've heard about this, so it's more like a refresher and let you know where we are. Um, and then the second part of the talk, uh, I concentrate on some recent work that we did um, on a method to try to put some bounds indirectly on some of the type of physics that can contribute to the anomalies. And uh, that to me is important because I think we've well past the time in which uh, the useful thing for theorists to do is to give, get another model that fits the anomalies. I think what we need to do now is either improve the uh, standard model calculation so it can become more precise or come up with clever ways of testing the physics that purportedly is involved in the anomalies. The real, you know, more uh, uh, bottom line physics. So let me start with that review. No. Try with the finger first. Ah, with the finger first. So. Okay. Try now. So, no. Oh, now it works. Thank you. So there's two types of anomalies that uh, uh, we talk about in, 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 in physics. There's the uh, B2, uh, B2S plus leptons. So P2S transition in general, and then the semi-electronic uh, decays B2C. And uh, I'm gonna go briefly to what's in them. Um, so I'm gonna classify this uh, uh, understanding of anomalies into uh, clean, semi-clean and dirty. Uh, and clean are things like, uh, or sort of like a left and university biodating ratios. Here's the example that, uh, you probably have seen uh, the rate for the K of a B meson into K on plus a mu pair relative to the uh, decay of a B meson to a K on and an electron pair. Now, you don't have to be a very careful and bright uh, theorist to figure out that unless you're very close to the end of a spectrum um, where you know phase space can play a role and the mass difference between these guys can play a role. Just the universality of the uh, uh, weak interactions and electromagnetism means that this ratio is one. And so this, this thing here means that the uh, invariant mass of the lepton pair is taken between 1.1 GD square and 6 GD square, which is uh, uh, you know, away from the end of the spectrum, which is a much lower energy. And therefore, you expect this to be one to very high accuracy. You can actually try to compute the corrections to one tiny. Um, and, um, and, and they don't really depend very crucially on your understanding of the details of the process. Um, so that's what I mean by a clean ratio. A semi-clean ratio is things like a, a, the B mass on the K to mu plus or minus, just to be fair. Uh, it just de depends on one number, theoretically, the, the, uh, that is hard to uh, uh, determine, which is the K constant, just like the pi K constant for pi to mu mu. There's a B decay constant for B2 mu mu. And it's the same decay constant that enters these. Uh, and the rest of the theory shows this consistent when you understand the standard model. So you can 
compute that decay constant, which we do on the lattice, uh, then you're good to do it. So that's what I mean by semi chain because there's, it's not just the ratio that is one, but it depends on one number that we can uh, compute well on the lattice. And then by dirty, I mean a lot of other stuff like uh, angular distribution and decay of these things, um, uh, the total rates themselves, and the measure rates, uh, for which the theory is not very good. So we need to have some hadronic models and this and that. And so um, the predictions are not very clean and the errors are not, uh, is, if the expression is not systematic, the errors are not well under control. And so if you try to conclude something about new physics here, um, it's a little more questionable. <clears throat> On the B2C L new, there's two types of anomalies that people talk about. There's exclusive versus inclusive determinations of the angles of the CKM metric gamma VCD. I'm not gonna talk about it because it's a confused state of affairs, at least in my mind. Um, and, um, but there is another set of anomalies uh, which are very similar to these uh, clean ratios here Lepenusati violating ratios um, in the case of a B meson to in this process B to C L nu, um, which in the final state the charm becomes a B meson or a C star. And what's interesting here is that um, it's the case in which the lepton is a tau lepton compared to the others, either electron or muon, when you find a deviation from the expectation. Now this ratio is not expected to be one because the tau lepton is much heavier than the muon and the electron. In fact, it's a significant fraction of the mass of the B comparable to the B. And so uh, uh, the ratio is not expected to be one, but it's very uh, well under control because the ratio depends on a form factor that largely cancels out. Uh, so, uh, so this can be computed with very high accuracy and it's, uh, it will qualify as something like the clean or semi clean. So, so, I am confused, so I don't want to discuss it. I've, I've worked a lot on this. Uh, the bottom line is that the determination of VCV uh, from uh, 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 exclusive mode, so you just uh, uh, look for uh, B to D L nu, for example, and then you comp you, you you make a determination, term you know, yeah. using the theorem, so. and then you also determination from the inclusive decay. Well, you only you know, look for a left on the final state. And that also gives you a determination and they're, they're off by about 10%. And the error is much smaller in each determination. So clearly the theory is wrong because it's a question of counting. You could try to imagine new physics explanations of that. Nobody has come up with anything good. Uh, and I, 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 I don't want to discuss it. But I, I'm happy to discuss it in private. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me go very briefly to B, B2SLL theory in the standard model. Well, you know, we have the Fermi uh, interaction. I, I want to put this down because I'm going to use it. Uh, but, you know, you have the CKMs from the vertices. Uh, and then there's a four fermion operator. And there's a coefficient uh, that we call C2. Uh, uh, and it's, it's equal to one. And there is a weak scale, then you run down to the, uh, like all loser coefficients, you run down to the scale of the B physics and it deviates from one by about 20%, but it's very, very, very uh, accurately calculated. Uh, then there's things like B2S gamma, where you have a one loop process. Uh, 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 you can integrate out the W and the T and you get a local operator, which looks like a transition magnetic moment. Uh, this coefficient C7 can be, uh, Again, computed with fairly good accuracy and then run, I mean, run down to the low scale. And this actually plays a little bit of a role in B2S equals C minus because the photon can uh, convert to, to a pair, but it's really only important very end to the, uh, very close to the end of the spectrum where the photon pole uh, plays a role. And that's why at the end of the spectrum, I told you before, is picked up at 1.1 GV squared to avoid this basically. Although it can be computed and it's under very good control. And then there's this set of diagrams uh, where you have uh, like this box, you can also have an intermediate Z. They look a lot like this, but there's a difference here when, the, when you exchange the photon and, more, and, and also when you exchange the heavy Z, 
uh, you get an interaction which doesn't have a photon fold, as you can see, there's no one over Q squared, you get a local interaction. This is a four fermion operator with a B to S and a lepton pair. There's two different operators here, and I'm gonna point those out because it's important for the discussion. Uh, one, which is a vector current for the leptons, which is called C9, and the one has an axial current, gamma mu gamma phi for the leptons, which is called C10. And again, you compute them, you run down, and numerically, coincidentally, C9 and C10 happen to be about the same magnitude with opposite signs. It didn't have to be this way, but that's just what happens numerically. Um, now this plays a role uh, as you'll see later. So, uh, uh, so suppose that you want to compute the decay rate. What you do is you take that effective Hamiltonian and um, compute the amplitude we're going to be to this uh, final state. Of course, that operator had the leptonic piece, which doesn't have some interactions because we neglect the electromagnetic interactions. It just gives you, you know, Dirac spinners with, with, with the gamma matrices. And then you have that coefficient we had before. And then this operator, uh, which is a current, has to be evaluated between the, uh, the, the states. The empty states. Um, now, this is a hard thing to compute. It's non-perturbative. It can be characterized in terms of form factors. And these form factors can be determined on the lattice. You can learn a lot about them from symmetry arguments and heavy quark effective theory and yada, yada. The point is that they're very well, very well fairly well known. Um, so if this is all you were interested in, uh, this rate is semi-clean because you still have to know some of the form factor um, and, and it would be very in, in, in fairly good uh, shape. Uh, and, and you can see that if you take the ratio of these or the square of these to the corresponding one for, uh, the one is electrons and one is, the other one is muons, all of these cancels out and you get just the ratio of the, uh, of, of the Dirac spinners, uh, which don't cancel out because the mass of the electron is different from the mass of the muon. So at a large enough energy that becomes irrelevant. So that's the clean that I was talking about. However, there's some complications and this is where the dirtiness comes in. This is a, this is a cartoon of the rate of the uh, spectrum uh, as a function of that invariant mass of the E plus E minus. By the way, invariant mass is just the momentum of the pair squared. That's what we mean by it. It's the language sometimes. Um, and, um, and there's kind of three regions that are kind of interest, interest um, a very high invariant mass. Uh, 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 well, let, let, let me, let me uh, just cut to the chase because we run, I don't want to run out of time. But you can see that uh, when, when the invariant mass is in this intermediate region, when the Q square uh, can uh, uh, coincides with uh, the charmonium or the charmonium region, this other operator that I didn't pay attention to before um, uh, starts playing an important role. And the point is that you can imagine taking these, this operator, which is just a three level Fermi interaction and take this, this charm anti-charm, close the loop, make a photon and you're good. Uh, you can also contribute to this rate, except that when you, when you put a CC bar together, not only do you, you get a, a perturbative loop, you can make a, a, a bound state of charm and anti-charm and you get these incredible resonances, right? And they show like this, you know, uh, uh, additional oscillations here, which are excited states and uh, quiet states. But also the effect of these resonances will, will you know, spread out into some region here. Um, and so we can't ignore these but down to some region. And this is number six that you saw before, the 1.1 to six is some arbitrarily big, thinking that you know, uh, beyond below that, we're probably good. We probably we can probably use perturbation theory. And it's not well justified, I'll just say that. Um, but uh, but you can see how you do the calculation. You take that operator, you take a time order product of that operator with an electromagnetic current. So I put a C bar C with a two thirds E, right? And then the other electromagnetic current uh, uh, hooks up to, uh, to your electron pair. So you put a minus E and there's a propagator one over Q square. 
And, and that would be the additional contribution to, to, to your amplitude, same amplitude as before. So now here's an expression for the whole rate. There's some coefficient. Um, there was the C9 and C10 contribution from the previous slide that I showed you. And now I, uh, they come with this form factor, F12 squared. So now what I did, I took it out and I said, okay, there's an additional contribution from these. Notice that because it's an electromagnetic current, this is a vector current. So it, it acts just like C9. It just acts in the same amplitude. Um, and, um, and I can't quite you know, distinguish these guys very well. This is, however, there's still that universality uh, in, in, in that coefficient. So if all you carry is this clean observable, it still cancels out in the ratio. But the dirty observables depend on these very crucially. For example, the total rate depends on how big this is. The annular distribution, which you probably have heard many talks on flavor anomalies, which says C9 explains the deviations in P5 prime. P5 prime is the name of some moment of some annular distribution. It doesn't matter what the degree is, it's in detail. Um, well, you can see that changing C9 is the same as changing these. It's the same, right? they add together. And so if you don't understand this because it's non-perturbative and you don't understand it, then, um, then your lack of understanding of this can show up uh, as, 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 as new physics in C9. Okay? So you have to take this a little bit, you have to be very careful in understanding this. Um, once you actually, decide that there is a deviation from the standard model and you want to fit to uh, see the deviations in C9 and C10 from the standard model, then uh, you have to say something about how large this is. And so those fits in new physics also depend on how poorly you understand or how well you understand uh, this, this additional contribution. So that's, that's a caveat. Okay, so now, uh, if you do find new physics, and I'll show you the physics in a second, um, how you describe it. So the usual thing to do is to say, well, I'm going to allow for C9 and C10 to change. And in fact, I'm going to allow to have even other operators that don't appear in the standard model. You can take, uh, well, there's also C7 that I showed before, but you can take the chirality flipped operator. So just instead of a V minus A term for the course, I put a V plus A. So the same name with a prime, so standard notation. And then there's other operators that uh, we haven't talked about. There's a whole bunch of scalar and pseudo scalar operators, scalar in the leptons, either, either right handed or left handed, uh, scalar operator for quarks, or uh, um, axial scalar, pseudo scalar for the leptons. And again, so for three, and then you can also have tensors and so on. So this is something you can do. And it gets a little unwide, unwidely, and it's hard to do fits. Um, there's something you can do. You're willing to assume that the new physics is heavy enough that uh, it decouples and then leaves it with the standard model with higher dimension operators. This is kind of fairly standard thing to do. It's new physics, it's heavy, something at one TV. Then, uh, then you can write out your specs. We had a seminar about specs last week. And some operators on the SMEP could contribute. And, and, and because the SMEP is much more restrictive than just the standard model, that the, the, uh, the uh, low energy version of the, of the standard model, then you, then you save some stuff. In particular, from those four scalar operators, you, uh, you only get two that survive, and there's no tensor operators. Um, and some of the vectors also get simplified. So, um, so that's what I'm going to assume. Uh, let me show you why that's important. Um, the, this is the way these scalar operators uh, contribute to uh, this decay that I mentioned uh, in the first slide, B, B sub S or B sub E to um, uh, mu plus mu minus uh, or, or, or E plus E minus anyway. Um, so there's uh, the scalar uh, and the current eclipse scalar contribute uh, the pseudo scalar uh, contribute uh, and they contribute together with C10. So C10 is like the axial vector. And as I told you, it's just like pi to mu nu where the axial vector contributes and there's a decay constant. This is like the axial vector again. 
uh, secant of secant prime. And, um, and just like with pi to mu nu, remember the reason pi to mu nu is 10,000 times larger than pi to e nu is because uh, of, of the uh, lepton chirality sleep that you need. So there's a factor of the lepton mass square. Um, so so this, this current here comes with a factor of, uh, relative to this uh, pseudoscalar operator of the lepton mass. Now, why is that interesting? It's interesting because this term becomes quite negligible and you get really from, 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 from a bit to, uh, ah. the new physics of course is only in this, in this uh, coefficient or in a shift of C10. Um, but you can see that if these operators are going to be of the size required to explain the other anomalies, which would require them to be order one, as, you, as I'll show you later, um, then um, um, uh, then they, they would completely swap, swap these operators. And to show you why uh, these bonds are interesting, uh, you can see that these differences, of course, this is CS versus CS prime from you know, using data and, and fitting to this, uh, you get a, a band which is fairly narrow, but the band is infinite, so it's very narrow. The numbers could be large enough, and you can still explain the anomalies. It's just a correlation between them. However, as I showed you a second ago, if you assume the physics is the coupling from new heavy physics, then uh, there's relations between those uh, four operators, and those relations change the C P uh, and minus C P prime into C S plus C S prime. So now you see that. Putting a bundle of, this, of the difference of the square plus the sum of the squares gives you circles. And, and these circles have, you can see these numbers here, 0.2, are very, very, very tiny. And you can even understand the 0.2, as I said, this number C10 is, is 4.5. The, the type of change that you need to explain the new physics is order one. Um, and so, um, um, so if, if, if this explains the standard model and it's suppressed compared to this by a factor of m mu on over mb, which is about 50, 100 over, uh, 100 over five, over five to the, so 0.1, right? Um, so 0.1 over five is, is about that number, right? Um, and, um, and that's why this is so small. And just see it from this formula, which means that these guys cannot cannot be useful in explaining the anomaly. This is too small by this, which makes it great because there's no scalar, there's no tensors. All we have to fit to is vectors, and then you can actually do fits. So, um, so here's what people call the clean fit. This, by the way, is, is so to do a fit. Clearly, you need to include this data because that's important in, in restricting these guys. And then is this level universality ratio. So feeding to those three things, we get this, this, uh, this plot here. Um, I assume that the only things that vary is C9 and C10. And if you do that, uh, the variation in, in change from the standard model of C9 and the change of the standard model from C10 um, is, uh, uh, well, is shown in this, uh, in this plot. Uh, if you just look at the standard model by itself, the standard model by itself, don't assume anything about new physics and say, how good is the standard model fit to data? Okay. No new physics, just is the standard model consistent with the data? So the standard way to, to do that for people who, who do statistics is to calculate a p-value, which is the probability that, uh, yeah, is the probability that you agree with the data by, 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 uh, by accident. And, and, and the number is tiny, it's, it's 10 to the minus five. So in the language that we use in particle physics, it's, it's off by 4.2 sigma from, from data. Uh, in other words, when this gets to five, that's what people usually would say, the standard model is, is, is uh, uh, was it observably wrong? I don't know the language. Um, uh, if instead you, you, you put in uh, a new physics, say in C9 and C10, um, 
and um, and ask the question, which is different, uh, how large is the pool? Um, then the pool, if you only have a C10, the pool is 5.3 sigma. If you have what we call C left, which is C9 minus C10, actually the current was a uh, V minus A current instead of just vector or just axial. Uh, you get a little bit more of a pool, uh, but they're about the same. Um, if you if you get um, if you uh, have only C9, the pool is a little smaller, it's 4.5. So you can see that C9 would explain it at uh, uh, right here somewhere. Um, C C10 would explain it right there, and then this thing at 45 degrees, a line around 45 degrees, which is what I call CL, um, uh, works very well, very close to that uh, central value. These things at the bottom, let me not go through, through them in detail, but uh, this is what happens when you make a combined feed uh, of, of these clean observables that I described and the observables that I call dirty. So you have to make some assumptions about what uh, this theory is that you calculate with and so on. And so what we do is we cover a lot of them. We, make, we, we do a profile over a lot of uh, that stuff. Um, and we are, I think, very conservative. So it makes our results not change that much. But that's that feed, and in dotted lines is the clean feed, which you should probably plus uh, much better. And what happens is it pulls it a little bit down, um, and it becomes actually even more consistent with a pure, pure C left, pure V minus A interpretation. But as I said, when you start looking at the total rate or the uh, angular distribution, remember C9 comes together with that uh, thing we cannot cal cal calculate from SARM, the CC bar piece. And so um, if, 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 if it's our lack of understanding of that quantity that is confusing us, uh, we will assign that change to C9. And that's why this, that might be why, I'm not saying that's why, but that might be why when you put in that additional dirty stuff, these fits tend to favor more C9. Okay, okay. so that's... Uh, 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 Almost my last thing to say about uh, these anomalies. Um, uh, you want to know about microscopic models. I really don't want to spend time on these. There's, people have done uh, short distance uh, models uh, which are consistent with these assumptions I have for this feed. Uh, but you can also talk about uh, long distance models and meaning that the new mediators and new particles are lighter than the electroweak scale. And uh, the most Popular ones because they're uh, easier to deal with and uh, uh, harder to rule out are, are these uh, very short distance physics. And there's kind of two main types of explanations. Um, uh, you can have a Z prime, which is a Z prime, this gives you muons, and new pairs and electron pairs. And you can then make a Z prime that couples more to muons than to electrons. And then you have to be a little bit careful that you couple to D and S. It had, it, it's going to produce a stable change in neutral current. And then you have to do something to avoid that, uh, giving you problems with uh, B sub S mixing. So what you do is you couple it very weakly to DS and as strong as you can to the muons and don't couple it to electrons. And, 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 and that's what these type of models do. So another type of, uh, of models, leptoquarks, um, which are very cool because they avoid this piece of S mixing problem automatically. You take a big quark that changes by the interaction into a muon. <laughs> so, um, so that's, there's no flavor change in neutral current. Then the mediator then take, take the, uh, the, the, uh, the light quark and changes that into an anti-muon. And, um, um, and then it turns out some of these give you give you this card, this V minus A, some give you scalar, some give you V plus A. And, and there's only a few, you can classify all of the laptop quark uh, models, the ones with vector laptop quark, scalar laptop quark, with these quantum numbers and those. And it turns only on, on the, uh, a few actually work. Um, and uh, the one that works the best, curiously enough, um, is a vector. And it has the quantum numbers of what you would get in Pachy-Solandi unification. 
So that got a lot of people very excited because if this is, if these anomalies are uh, eventually completely established and, and, and this continues to be uh, uh, preferred, then maybe, just maybe, we're actually looking at the first effects of quite a unification, but unification at the 10 TV scale, not at the 10 TV 10 TV scale or 10 TV 15. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, let me turn to another anomaly <clears throat> that I want to spend the rest of the talk on. And that's the anomaly in, in, in Taos. I mentioned it before, it's these ratios, which uh, test that the universality. There's other anomalies uh, that do, I mean, other related observables. Hmm? Yes, yeah, so, so the question was those that support do they in, in, induce at one loop transitions to other quarks and uh, uh, proton decay and things like that. Uh, the answer is, uh, for proton decay, uh, depending on the quantum number of the leptophore, it may uh, uh, produce, it may possibly produce proton decay at three level or, uh, uh, or, through a, or, or only through a non-normalizable operator or not at all. And this is a classification. This one is safe at three level, the one that works here, but not from a non-normalizable operator. Uh, which means that if you have a something above Patti Salam that produces, if there's nothing about that all the way to the Planck scale, there would be some Planck suppressed operator that would produce proton decay, which is not a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, there's other processes that you can look for that are loop mediated, but because the scale of these particles has to go at 10 TV, they would be very suppressed. So that would be, if this is correct, it would be a whole, other industry of, of checking all of these things. Okay, so there's these observables, they're all related to this B2C tau new anomaly. This is, this is uh, again, um, the excess is more than four sigma. I don't want to go into the details like I went before um, for the other case. Um, uh, the, uh, this is the set of observables that uh, one combines and this is the standard model prediction. Uh, actually, I have a better slide somewhere. No, yeah, I think I have a better slide. But anyway, this is this is from HBAC from a couple of years ago. This is a combination they did. This is uh, some of the data that the standard model prediction. So this is this is the one sigma combination of data, and this is uh, the standard model. You can see the deviation. Um, uh, again, um, the the low energy effect you see from the standard model um, is a current current interaction, B minus A, B minus A. Uh, if you want to compute the decay rate in the standard model, you need to get, again, as before, the matrix element of this has, this becomes a spinner with some factors. And then um, the, the matrix element, again, can be computed, uh, uh, can be parameterized in terms of form factors. The form factors can be computed from the lattice. In this case, also from experiment, because you can actually do the experiment uh, uh, for electrons and neons and measure it very carefully and fit using something called the Z expansion and compare it to the lattice. There's a lot of very good information on these form factors. Uh, and, um, and then the form factors then cancel uh, uh, mostly in those uh, uh, ratios, except that, as I said, the, the tau mass cannot be uh, neglected and you have to use them. And that's why there's, the, there's a non-zero size to this thing. It comes from that uncertainty in the form factor. Um, so, um, uh, so our, our analysis of the data, again, if you just look at the standard model, the p-value, this is not a small number as before, um, we get uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 3, which corresponds to 2.7 sigma. Uh, this was uh, with the newest data. Uh, it has been 3, point, uh, 3 sigma. The, uh, the errors went down. The central value uh, moved significantly towards the standard model, but the, the, the errors went down significantly. 
So the significant thing changed much, although the central values changed. And that happened uh, 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 almost a few years ago, and there's no new data for that. Um, the, if you want to compare to new physics, you do what we did before. You take you know, all of the possible operators at dimension six. So it's a scalars, scalar operators with a left hand. Here, the neutrino side, of course, has a P left because it's a neutrino in the standard model. Um, uh, but uh, for the quarks, you can have a, a, a left-handed quark, a right-handed quark. Um, you can have tensor operators. Uh, and then this is the standard model operator, but you can change the coefficient. And there's a right-handed current, a B plus A current that you can also couple to. In fact, if you make the same assumption that this uh, physics that decouples that produces these, so you use this math, and then that tells you that this operator cannot contribute. There, there is something like this in this map, uh, but it, um, it, it gives you a flavor universal contribution. So there's only uh, four of these uh, coefficients that you have to worry about. Uh, and let me skip these. And um, so this is a kind of a given idea of, of, of what they do. This is where you want to be. This is the standard model. And this tells you if you just change the vector, uh, you would be moving along this green line, line that does pretty well as far as trying to reproduce this anomaly. Um, if you uh, if you only have a tensor, you move along this line, which is not too bad. It's very close in e e efficiency as the vector as view vector. And these things that I put here is called the scalar scalar tensor in blue, uh, which has this relation. Which turns out to be something that you get in a lot in a lot of models. This, this relation is uh, aromatic at the matching of some new physics scale. So we also uh, put it in there, although it doesn't do as, as well as the others. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, feeds uh, taking two two of these uh, two of these coefficients and 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 and, and setting the others to zero and because we. Uh, we also try to do a feed to everything. It's, 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 you get something. Uh, but this is kind of instructive. Um, the, uh, the, the, well, so the feed is in, in orange at uh, one, one sigma and I think it's two sigma and three sigma, the orange and the, and, and, and the green. So I, now I can't I can remember. Uh, and, uh, and here's the numbers that you, you don't really have to uh, memorize, uh, and, uh, but, um, uh, but it's interesting that uh, the pool is, well, you can see the pool for the pure vector or, uh, and, and the tensor, there are these things that I showed here, uh, are comparable, no surprise, because you can see how that was gonna work. Um, and for the pure scalar, uh, uh, it's uh, the left-handed scalar uh, is, is, is poorer. For the right-handed scalar, uh, it's a little better. And then you can have pairs and you can see how it works, doesn't matter. What I want to point out to you is, so this is evolving and uh, we'd like to, to, to see what else we can say about these parameters without looking directly at these observers. And this is what I want to spend the rest of my 20 minutes talking about. So these um, gray lines that you see, these shades, come from bound from the B sub C lifetime, which is what I want to talk about now. Uh, these circles come from um, uh, uh, producing a tau in a DLHC, so proton proton collision. You pick a B core from a proton and an anti charm from the other proton. Uh, and, uh, and produce through this interaction a tau. And, um, it, and, and then that actually, the absence of those events uh, puts a bound, uh, which um, the dotted line is a projection as to how well did it do after 10 years of running of the next generation LHC or something. Uh, and this one is some other sort of projection. Um, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's actually the current LHC best data. That <coughs> But the dotted line is uh, made to be. Um, uh, so I want to talk about these gray regions. And um, let me just say one thing. The, to make plots, the light gray, which means uh, 
It means everything from here to else uh, is a uh, uh, rules out. Assumes that the branch interaction uh, of the tau, of B sub C to tau nu is 10% or, or, or smaller. And the, the darker gray assumes it's 30% or smaller. So, so here's the point. So, so this decay that seems to be anomalous uh, involves this quark level interaction. Time goes from left to right, B goes to C tau nu. Well, if you read this going down, um, you can think of this as a B sub C, B with a C bar, which is a B sub C, producing a tau nu. And it crosses them the same uh, vertex. I also said before uh, a, a, a second ago that you can imagine this coming from a proton, this one an anti proton, it also uh, uh, tells the same vertex. Um, so, um, so it's nice because this gives an ind independent test of this anomaly. The branching fraction can be computed very well, um, uh, including uh, those, uh, you know, the change to the uh, vector including all of the new physics, this is the only thing that comes in, the change to the vector and the change to the pseudo-scalar uh, operator. And, um, and everything here is pretty well known, uh, ex except the decay constant X of DC, which has been computed from, from, uh, uh, from theory. Um, but the interesting thing is again, because the pseudo, the, the, Again, the same thing. It's like B, it's like pi to mu nu. Uh, the, the pseudo scalar operator is enhanced by a factor of the meson mass over the tau mass. Not as large as the meson mass of the electron mass, but it's still, when you put in the numbers, it gets a factor of uh, four, and the square is 16. It's a large enhancement that makes it very uh, sensitive. Um, so, um, um, so if you wanted to use these numbers, this epsilon p, to explain the new physics uh, of this anomaly, you will need epsilon p to be about one and a half. No, it doesn't sound like a huge number, uh, but if you put one and a half in here, the branching fraction for the B sub C decay is six hundred percent. So clearly, you can put a bound on this, right? This is the first thing that you know. So, so this is a sensitive code. Here's the problem. You open this particle data book, this is what's known about B sub C. Uh, the lifetime is known very well, I'll show you in a second, but the branch interaction is nothing is known. This looks like a measurement of something with huge errors, uh, but, but it's not a branch infraction. It has to be multiplied by some other factor that we don't know. So we don't know anything and uh, it's not gonna change soon. So we need another strategy. And the idea for this strategy was to, uh, um, uh, to just make use somehow of the lifetime being known very, very accurately, 1% accurate, one and a half. Um, so, um, so we thought that the, the, the calculation of the total lifetime is relatively well understood and that we could use that. So the, uh, there's an OPE calculation, I'll go over that, uh, which gives errors, which are, I know, 30, 40%, which gives you, you know, um, you can use the upper bound here that, that, is, that, that the uh, lifetime is less than whatever, 0.7 picosecond. Um, and, um, um, and then if you look at that calculation, the, contribution uh, for the, the contribution that includes B to C tau nu, B sub C to tau nu uh, is part of this thing that I call OP with annihilation, uh, which you know, we looked at the paper, it's 3%. Uh, um, and so, you know, we can say, okay, we're gonna match this to the experiment. 97% um, is that OP calculation. The other 3% is this weak annihilation which includes this stuff, so it's bigger than this, which allows us to put a bound on this by using the minimum value for gamma obtained as, as you know, the maximum value of the lifetime from, from, from that calculation. 
And you put that in there, that's very conservative, I think, and you get the debranching fraction has to be less than 30%. Um, and um, and, and you know, we already saw that this is gonna be powerful. Um, here's a plot that shows you the BC to tiny uh, branching fraction uh, versus the uh, this anomaly, this R to G sub uh, ratio. Um, the standard model prediction for the ratio is this. This, this anomaly is the fact that this is not the standard model value, it's in, in this range I showed you before. And this line here is what you get if you uh, modify the standard model by adding that, uh, that epsilon p, right? Um, and so, um, so sure, as epsilon p increases, you get to this number, but also branching fact the to be to time increases, and you and you know you rule it out quite quite badly. So um, you rule it out quite badly if you assume that you grant that that the branching fraction has to be less than thirty percent. Um, and this is what was shown in those gray regions in those squares that uh, that I showed you before. So. I think I'm going to skip this history of, of, of B sub C lifetime. It's kind of entertaining, but it has no uh, real value to it. Um, um, so I want to tell you what this calculation is about and what we've done to try to improve it, which is what spent the, we spent more than a year trying to do it. Uh, so clearly an improvement on the calculation, improving that 30% down to 10%, it will be very valuable. And for that, what we need to do is bring down those errors in the OPE calculation that we got from a paper by Benek and Bukala, to give them credit, it's, it's one of your slides, um, from uh, 1995, so 25 years old, we've learned something since then. Um, so the OPE calculation, you know, um, I made a, a slide to skip this one. Here, here's, the, here's what the OP calculation does. So first of all, the B lifetime you get from getting uh, the forward scattering amplitude and then cutting this. You take the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. Um, and then you assume that uh, this forward scattering amplitude can be expanded as an operator product as, as if it were an operator called expansion. So the sum of, sum of local operators. And these local operators are increasingly more suppressed by something. So in the case of B mass on decay, this is used and this expansion is increasingly more suppressed in the mass of the heavy core. For B sub C, uh, the state, uh, you don't have any cork effect this clearly to help you because the two corks are actually, it's, it's like a J side, it's like an, it's like an onion, not hydrogen atoms, right? Um, and so, uh, so what you use is a non relativistic expansion. And so this expansion here is in powers of the relative velocity of the cork in this case. Um, and, and, and so you have this set of operators. And in addition, there's this weak annihilation that plays a role for us because the tau nu is part of this. If uh, I put a D and an S here, a, a D and a U course or an S and a C course, but put also a lepton and neutrino in this, in this diagram. And, and this, so when you cut this, you get that kind of a decay. Uh, but again, remember we tend to do inclusive. So you make an expansion of these and the local operator is a four core operator here. At the end of the day, what you have to do is compute these coefficients from this thing. And then the matrix elements of these operators between these B sub C states, you have to compute somehow. And the beauty of this is that the, the leading operator uh, is a symmetry generator. It's, it's like a current. And so the matrix element is, is, is known exactly. It's, it's just like this. It's just the total charge under that current, which is normalized to one. Um, so so um, uh, that, that's a leading operator. The leading coefficient that goes with that operator uh, happens to then correspond to what you get uh, from computing the, the fourth level decay rate. So, so the leading term in the expansion is just the, the, the perturbative 
um, uh, decay width of the quark. And then all of the non perturbative stuff comes from these higher level, higher order operators. Um, so, um, so what did we do to improve the calculation that I see from 25 years ago? Well, that calculation was done uh, the perturbative part of the calculation using all uh, on shell mass. Bad thing to do because the on shell mass is known to have you know, produced normal ambiguity. So the, the, the function, the perturbative function doesn't convert. Even the lowest orders are um, uncertain because of the ambiguity. So what we did is they say, well, let's say we know that there's no normal on ambiguity. So we use a uh, MF bar mass. Uh, it's also been shown that uh, the epsilon, epsilon C mass uh, doesn't have a normal on ambiguity. That's uh, one in which you find the D equal mass. Uh, in terms of the epsilon mass, and actually in Brian, in, in Brian, uh, uh, actually did calculations to fourth order in connecting uh, those two numbers. So you can have this epsilon mass can be computed in terms of the B mass as an expansion uh, alpha strong. So this is known uh, very well, and this, this, the scheme is complicated, but we know how to use it. And there's another scheme where you can, when you have the charm quark also, uh, which we call the meson scheme, where you use the B mass from this epsilon scheme. And for the charm mass, you fix it from this relation that the mass difference in heavy quarks per QT is given by the difference of mesons plus corrections that we also include to some order uh, that come from non perturbative strength in this heavy quark expansion. So those three are known to not have normal ambiguity. So we did the three of them. So we can compare how well this thing works. Uh, we actually had to, to use the correct one to computation for this one process. Oh, so we computed the perturbative part not at three level, but at one loop, the next, uh, next to leading order. Uh, we required the running of the wisdom coefficients at two loops. Uh, we included the penguins that were not included before. We, uh, we used the input improved the input parameters. Uh, we found new relations from in symmetry to, to relate uh, the non-perturbative matrix elements so there's less input from non-perturbative stuff. Um, and uh, the matrix element, by the way, for B sub C, most of them are computed uh, not from lattice, but from using potential models. And they're claimed to be unknown to 10% accuracy. And I can't really ascertain how good those claims are. Um, um, in that non relativistic counting, these uh, weak, weak annihilation, poly inter uh, sorry, poly inter uh, operators, which are these four core operators, actually come in at third order in the non relativistic expansion, beta to velocity. Um, and we don't keep that order in everything else. Um, uh, the, the beta happens to be. The, the uh, defined structure constant in the hydrogen atom here also alpha s. I would turn it up alpha s cubed in the calculation, but the reason it makes sense to keep it for, for keep this PI, uh, these weak annihilation operators, uh, is that since they correspond to two body decays instead of three body decays in the perturbative calculation, remember I have these uh, two body intermediates take you instead of three. They actually get in, in, in an extra factor of 16 pi squared. And so numerically, they're important. And you can just, just cleanly separate the calculation. And it, 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 uh, it's still consistent um, if you keep it separate. Um, they, for example, they don't introduce new uh, artificial new dependence and so on. Um, then we also keep additional beta to the fourth, beta square and beta to the fourth terms in, in a some, uh, um, in the sense that we keep four order terms in the operators, uh, in the expansion of the operators, without calculating the coefficients for order alpha to the fourth. And the only reason we did that is that we wanted to see how important these operators are, just to check. And we use that to estimate errors, not to actually compute anything. Um, so the convergence of the expansion is, 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 is uh, you can see it here. Uh, for the B quark, uh, this, as I said, it's next to living order. So three level plus that, 
And you can see it's pretty, you know, 30%, maybe 8, 10%, 20%. Uh, for these other schemes, um, um, it works uh, if the, the convergence is faster. But that's, that was known. That's just, just repeating what's known. Uh, at the charm level, where alpha s is larger, things get very, very dramatic. Um, you can see here the, uh, uh, the, the expansion doesn't seem to be converging very fast in the NFR scheme or in the meson scheme. For the epsilon scheme, it's a little better. Uh, but the number is a little wacky. Um, and uh, the non, non perturbative expansion, um, so here's the first term, which I call one, and you can see it actually converges pretty fast. That's because it was, it, they're really non relativistic. So, um, um, uh, by the way, these corresponds, I said, this series of operators one has the d square, one has this uh, kind of Darwin term, d to the fourth. But it converges pretty decently. Uh, let me skip that. These are the results. I don't want to, again, this is not something that you need to memorize. I just want to show you that what you need to do is, is compute these things um, mode by mode. And then each one has a perturbative and a non perturbative calculation. The, non -perturbative, the, the, the perturbative one is known to leading order, which is a mess because it's all this blended stuff. Um, and to the Browning. Um, and the, uh, this is the Benek and Bukala old result. Um, their number is almost right smack on the exponential number for the, for the uh, width. Our numbers uh, are all over the place. Um, uh, but I think we have better control over what, what's in, in the calculation. Okay, so this is the bottom line. And the bottom line is that the numbers uh, as I said, are spread out and the errors, here we just listed uh, the sources of errors and whenever we had to combine errors to deal with linear D, so we don't think theory errors would become uh, uh, added in quadrature. Um, and uh, so these, these errors are so large that the three numbers are consistent with each other, but, uh, but they don't give us any confidence that uh, that we can use them for anything. Well, we will try. We try to use physical bounds. We haven't done that. But we do have an idea, and I want to close with this. I'm going to go five minutes. Well, we started five minutes late. So uh, the idea was uh, uh, is the following the, the largest error here, this thing called mu, is the perturbative calculation. And this mu error means that we determine it by varying the value of mu of the generalization scale at which we compute this, 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 this uh, uh, perturbative calculation. And which is a very standard thing to do. It, it really does capture the next order in alpha s. Um, and you can see that is by large, by far the largest, uh, maybe not for the epsilon case, but certainly for the MS bar and also for this Meson scheme, these are the largest uh, errors. And then we realize something um, that when you do the calculation of the B lifetime or the D lifetime, and you use that OPE expansion, the first term in that OPE expansion is identical to the first term. This is fine, just this coefficient, which is the, the perturbative, uh, 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 the perturbative width of the D quark or the C quark multiplied by the matrix element of an operator, which is different, uh, uh, but it's normalized by symmetry. So again, just one. So if you take these, um, the sum of the lifetimes or the sum of the widths of the B and D method and subtract the width of the B sub C, the, that perturbative contribution cancels out. And all you're left with from the OPE is the non-perturbative term, in other words, these suckers cancel out of the calculation. Of course, some big chunk of these cancels out, but we don't care because we can compute this from the experimental value of B and D uh, corrected by these non perturbative stuff. And sure, the non perturbative stuff we don't know, but with these errors, not those errors. So sounds like a great idea. We're very excited about this. Um, I, I, I call these things that were like the, the two, these, these operators with two legs instead of four 
uh, ISO singlet because they're the same for QC spheres Y. Um, if you take a B0 or a B minus, it's ISO spin, right? Um, these decays are identical because it's just the B core decaying, regardless of whether it's a D core or a U core. But in weak annihilation, it's a B with a U core, not with a D core. So, um, so these are isosinglets, and these are the guys which can produce a, a, a difference uh, between uh, the different uh, uh, members of the ISO doublet. And that's important because it's known experimentally that the lifetimes of the D plus and the D zero are very different. So here's the, uh, the sum of the sum of widths for the charge state is 1.7 in the picosecond, and for the neutral state is 3.10 in the picosecond. So when I use this for the B sub C lifetimes, uh, we you know we, we have a little bit of a problem here. But remember, we can we can put in the weak annihilation on this side and see if that accounts for for the difference. And sure enough, um, if you look at these numbers, right? The correction for the charge as I just showed the picture before is large and it brings the number up to this number 3.33. Now remember the experimental value for the B sub C last time is 1.9 something, 1 point for the week. So yeah, it brought them all together, but Here's a plot, what happens if you take uh, this guy, uh, take all of the perturbative parameters and, 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 and move them around by uh, within, within the three sigma errors, you get this, this thing, and here's the experimental value. Okay, so we have a great idea to solve a problem and then we find a completely different problem. Um, so we looked and looked and looked, and this is what we came up with. Um, so over years, some of you may have heard talks of the experts in this field. We're not, we're, we're newcomers. Uh, telling you what the uh, success it is, the computation of the ratios of lifetimes, D0 over D plus, and even D0 over D plus type uh, uh, width, or, or, or lifetimes in this ratio. And, um, and here's a, a this is, this is actually a scatter plot. It looks like a straight line, but it's a scatter plot. If you, if you take uh, these, these lifetimes have this isosinglet piece, which for the B meson is big, plus these uh, uh, thing that breaks uh, isospin, which is the uh, weak annihilation, also the power interference that I didn't explain. Um, but, um, so basically what you get in the ratio is one from the big piece plus a small correction, which is proportional to uh, you know, the width difference of the, of the B plus and the B zero, the correction from the numerator and the denominator, they just sign a difference. And that's why you get a straight line. Um, and, and this the scatter plot is again, just changing, moving over those one perturbative parameters. And you can see that this is the experimental value of the, of the lifetime difference. And this is the experimental value of the, of the ratio. Um, you can um, you can get the ratio correctly by choosing some parameters, but then you're not telling us that you don't get the lifetime difference correctly. And in fact, uh, it's easy to get the lifetime easy uh, the, the lifetime difference correctly. Uh, but then to get the ratio well, you have to um, move this, this thing to there. And that means changing that denominator, which is the, this isosinglet contribution. Um, so, and, and the, the situation is much more, so, so the rest here is what happens if I take the, 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 the calculation and just arbitrarily add to it an isosinglet piece, just by hand and choose it so that uh, it works kind of. Um, and I do the same thing for the D meson and the numbers that I get, these are, these are the, the changes that I have to make to get it to work. This is just D and D physics, it has nothing to do with B sub C. And so by hand, I add these numbers, uh, uh, which are fairly large corrections, by the way. And, and then I, I put that, assuming that those are uh, 
number of curative corrections that somehow are missed uh, in the isolated single piece, I put it back into this calculation of the B sub C width using the B0 and B0 or the B plus and B plus. And, um, and the number, this 3.03 or 3.33, shifts down by the sum of these two numbers to something which is very close to the fundamental value. Um, so that's the consequence of this. By the way, why, why a Ferrari? Because when they show you this ratio, it's like, wow, things work really well. They sell you this Ferrari. But I think really this is what they're selling us and they didn't let you look under the hood. Um, so so this, we don't understand this. I mean, this is just a completely ad hoc thing. Uh, but you might wonder what, what's behind that. And, and there's three options. I don't want to go through the details here. Um, one thing that you can imagine is the expansions are bad, but this is the nature of the expansions. I don't want, I just want to show you that the kind of expansions that we are looking at uh, are very well behaved. And so I don't think it's a nature of the expansion question. Um, the matrix, it's clearly a non-perturbative issue and there's a matrix, there's a matrix element in particular, it's called this I graph um, that is, um, when uh, that is not included in the lattice calculation of the matrix elements of the B and B meson lifetime. And the reason it's not included is that um, the same operator contributes to this. And this is kind of suppressed by an extra loop, each one of a 16 pi square. But this is not perturbative. <laughs> so, um, so I'm guessing that um, the neglect of this graph is. Why, why is it that a one over 16 pi square uh, in a graph like this uh, it cannot be a, a, a good counting? So here's an example that I already don't understand. G minus two. Now G minus two of the electron is out over pi. That's in fingers, uh, uh, gravestone, right? There's a clearly there's one over 16 pi square. G minus two of the proton is the same calculation. G minus two of the proton is two not alpha, right? So, um, so that's one possibility. Now, this is gonna be computed eventually. And if it's not suppressed, oh, by the way, if you assume that this is enhanced by 16 pi squared, you get about something which is, which could explain this, which is kind of interesting. It, um, but if that doesn't happen, then this, the whole assumption that you can do this OPE, which is not really guaranteed by anything, it's a kind of somewhat ad hoc, uh, uh, could be called into question. And then all of these, uh, these factorial calculations of, of, of lifetimes and lifetime differences and width differences and all of that goes out of the window. So, uh, and the last possibility is new physics, which I don't think has any chance of competing with this at all three levels. So this is my last slide. Sorry about this for time. Okay, so in, what improvements could we imagine? If this, if somehow you get this justified, this ad hoc thing becomes justified, but we don't understand how yet, um, then I showed you that this number could be obtained, which can then be useful in understanding these are uh, uh, the, the, the uh, R sub D anomalies. Um, but to make this useful, I have to take this number and make it smaller. Remember the whole point was to make this, this error smaller. So this point 51, which is actually in the Mason scheme um, is broken out into these, uh, these contributions. And the first one that I put in here in red comes from the number of calculations in B sub C. And those are computed at the very crudely, it's all calculations, the the resident coefficients at C level and so on. So I think this can, with very little effort, be reduced by a factor of two. The other one's not, not so easy. Uh, but this one from, from better experimental data can be reduced. Um, okay, what kind of bounds do we get from what we have already? Uh, well, the one is scheme, which overshoots the width, it gives you a tremendous bound from the new physics. The Mason schemes which undershoots it, or this B plus D idea that we have, which also undershoots it, 1.75, gives you worse than the 30% that we already have. 
Um, I like to be very honest. I don't like to sell you a used car. If you sold that, it's gonna. Be. So the better way to do this is by doing a fit, and we're gonna we're gonna working on that. Okay, so here's my summary. Uh, the anomaly signal is increasing. Well, for us, it has gone down a little bit, but um, for for um, I didn't tell you this for DB2S. We uh, had an update of last October with new data, and, and it went up to this 4.3 sigma. That was a new piece of information. Um, I, I said at the very beginning, I think the, the time for theories to write models is fast. I mean, I think you, you know a lot about what models work. I think we need to, to, to have better standard model calculations or new tests like this one that I uh, described above, or uh, you know, other such ideas. And finally, B and D lifetimes are, I think, a little bit of a mess. I think there's, there's, there's very serious questions with the calculations that exist. And in particular, uh, the question as to whether this I graph that is not computed uh, completely and delighted uh, uh, is, is, is the solution or the OPE doesn't work or, or, or what. So that's an open question. And we're all looking for Bell two to uh, to give us some new results on on, on anomalies. So with that uh, we want that four point three to become five. So we'll see. Thank you. Thank and sorry for taking our next job. Just a small comment on uh, slide uh, 16, I think. So you have this uh, transient ratio larger, larger than one. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I guess that uh, the expression you have on the top is an approximation for small transient ratios, right? Um, no, uh, the, the lifetime here is used from experiments. Okay. Right. So, so that's why this can ex exceed a hundred percent. Because then, then you should put a default in the denomination. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm gonna, I agree. This, this looks, uh, it looks ridiculous. <laughs> but that, that uh, what we're really trying to say, a yeah, better way I to know, say, know the method. yeah. But the problem it, is it, when you go to slide nineteen. When you uh -huh. okay, this when you have the plot, okay, you say the standard model uh -huh. and it's uh, close to zero, so this uh, you can neglect this expression in the denominator, of course. Mm -hmm. But then as you grow, you cannot uh, the curve will not be like this, it will be done. It would be when better you, instead of using branch, branch interaction, it will use the width because okay, if you use the width. Then, then there's no question. Then right. it's okay, but if you yeah, write that, then it should be. You, you have to do that. Thank you. So that's, 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 that's a very good point. It's, it's, it's really interesting. But, um, it's a good point. More about this uh, discussion of uh, the first part of the talk, the explanation in terms of three nine and three ten that you mentioned that there is a term that is not possible to separate from three nine except at some time the uh, conclusion to three nine is not so clear because it is linked to the other thing that we were calling the non perturbative that comes from the distribution in two square with the invariant mass of the Western curve. Yeah. Um, is there any way to separate the contribution of in the, in the interpretation in terms of 3, 9, and 3, 10? Cannot you use the uh, distribution with t squared as to separate such a contribution? Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. The, um, Maybe you can repeat the question for yeah. the Zoom people. Let, let, me, let me repeat the question for the Zoom people, uh, and let me find the slide. I, don't, I didn't write the number. There it is. The slide, so, yeah. so, so the question was, uh, in, in the discussion of anomalies, we saw that there's a, con a contribution uh, that comes from the, these um, four core cooperator with charm. Uh, they introduce, they in particular, contribute charmonium, uh, but that gets confused with the contribution from C9, which is a short distance contribution. And therefore, it makes it hard to uh, uh, really disentangle the anomaly from non perturbative effects. And the question is whether we can do something to disentangle these uh, by looking, for example, at uh, 
at, at, at uh, momentum distribution, so invariant mass distribution. And um, so there's a proposal by, by the group, uh, by the Rome group of uh, Marco, Ciccini, and collaborators um, to, to do just that. Mm -hmm. And to do, uh, so what they do is uh, you can take uh, this, this quantity here and, um, and replace it by an ad hoc expansion which is probably very, pretty well justified uh, and in powers of momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and you just keep a few terms because the momentum is small relative to the scale of MB. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then of course, uh, well, I think you have to be a little bit careful because it's one over Q squared. So the first term goes like one over Q squared. The next term um, uh, goes like a constant. If the constant doesn't get confused and there's a Q squared term. I think they stop there. Um, and then the idea is to try to, by fitting different momentum beams and, 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 and the angular. And of course, if you're doing this, you can actually now access the dirty observables because it's dirty. And that gives you more information. So the idea is uh, uh, to do the fit to try to access that information and then put, put it back into this interpretation. Um, and they had a paper uh, like that came out like a week or two ago. And I haven't looked at it to see if they actually have results, but that, but I saw the abstract and, and the introduction, and that's that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. So the other observables that they use uh, um, are, are these things that I call dirty observables uh, that include all of these angular distributions, mm -hmm. right? And and that has uh, uh, um, it, it it doesn't it doesn't produce uh, this combination exactly because it's all the combinations you can start with these entangling things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a very good question. And I should read that paper. <laughs> More questions or comments? I think we have the end. What is fascinating is the point. I think it's really a nice question. It's one that you argue how you have from pseudo scalar to F minus H prime right there. Right. So I, I didn't show you formulas, but um, these, uh, um, when you write down, well, here it should be. Um, when you write down these operators in this map, right, um, the notice that this, these are the only scale operators you can write down. Um, and notice that this is a U quark, so this doesn't help us because it needs to be closed at So these operators are out. Uh, and this you can see uh, is, is uh, you know, you only just have these, these two operators just because of the flavor rate they give that, right? It's a, right. So, um, uh, so, so there's only two operators instead of four. And when you write them out, they correspond to particular plurality. So instead of CF, you get CF minus what we call CP in one combination, mm -hmm. and instead of CS prime, you get CS prime plus CP prime. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is that P and P prime are not independent. They depend on these guys, and we have an opposite sign. So uh, you get CS plus CS prime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's actually simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's very, these are important for the whole success of this feed program. If you didn't have these, then, um, then these numbers could work, and then the feeds you would have to do four dimensional feeds, and then we probably not. Mm -hmm. This was done by the students. Yeah. Rodrigo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? All right. So we thank you, Benjamin, again. Thank you very much.